So I'd just like to introduce our next speaker, um, Deb Scammell uh, from Talking Livestock. She'll be talking to us today about pregnancy management, um, what we know now. Deb Scammell is a livestock consultant who founded her own business, Talking Livestock. She assists producers with nutrition and production planning in their sheep and beef enterprises by consulting directly to the farmers as well as running industry courses and projects. Prior to starting her own business, Deb worked in the commercial nutrition space and has also been involved in sheep genetics programs, EID extension and research activities. Deb is based in Seven Hill in the Clare Valley and today she's going to talk to us about the impact of heat stress on reproduction at joining, the economic case to pregnancy scan and manage use to, to a pregnancy status, and new research looking into some of the causes and contributing factors to new mortality, especially in multiple bearing ewes. Thanks, Deb. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'll grab that. All good. So thanks, Nathan. That was a great intro into um, a bit of planning, predicting the future, and working out where you're trying to head um, with your sheep enterprise. We had some good discussion over in the corner, and you know I think that's where I'm going to come into it too. What are the issues and how can you plan to avoid the same issues year after year? Um, but I'm going to be touching on um, a lot of sort of latest research. So I'll cover some of the basics, but there's been some really interesting projects going on within SA and other states within the last few years. So I'm just going to cover off on some of those. So um, Adelaide Uni's just done a really interesting review on sort of heat stress and reproduction over joining. Um, I'll touch on a recent preg scanning project that there's just some key messages coming out of Adelaide Uni. Um, and we'll go through some ewe mortality causes, um, another project that's come out of Victoria, and we'll talk a little bit on lamb survivability as well. So um, I guess the heat stress project, so there's been a lot of sort of projects looking at the effect of heat, heat stress on reproduction. So Adelaide Uni's had this recent project to basically review the data and see how it's affecting um, what we're all doing in the paddock. So, you know, a lot of my clients are sort of lambing in autumn into winter and we're often joining over those December, January, sort of hottest kind of months. You know, even Feb can be pretty hot. So. Um, basically, you know, you hear all about global warm, warming. We're looking at that projected increase in temperature over the next period of years. Um, so it has been one of the issues flagged as, you know, future of the sheep flock. It's going to have a potential um, quite large impact. So, you know, the summaries have sort of shown $2.1 million, um, lot, sorry, 2.1 pot potential lambs lost in the Australian sheep flock due to this effect of heat stress on fertility and um, rams as well. So when we're talking heat stress, um, you know, we're not talking a significant temperature, but it's moderate temperatures sort of over this 32 degrees, um, and it's for a prolonged period of time. So it's not your one-off hot day, but it's where you're getting those weeks or two weeks over joining, where you've got that prolonged heat that we're seeing quite a significant effect. Um, so what we're seeing with your ewes, um, that week prior to estrus, so the week before you put your rams in, um, during estrus and then the following five days is where we're seeing the biggest imp impact of this heat. Um, and with rams, the major impact is the heat effect on the ram prior to mating as they're developing that semen um, to join with the ewes. So, you know, there's some good summaries here um, of the times we've said. So you've got your ram here, um, you know, zeros when you're joining, putting the rams in with the ewes. Um, so your semen is taking sort of that six to eight weeks to develop. Um, so you can see there from 42 to 14 days prior to joining, um, any period of heat over sort of five to seven days is reducing fertility. Um, it's reducing the sperm numbers, but also you're getting an increase in abnormal sperm. So you find that you do have some embryos that potentially don't survive um, and also a decrease in pregnancy rates. So something to be aware of there. Um, and then we're seeing here the major impact on ewes is this seven days prior to mating and seven days into joining. So um, prior to a ewe, so you know, if you haven't used teasers, the ewes basically starting to cycle as the rams go in. They're stimulating them to start estrus. So if it's seven days prior to their estrus, um, 
they've had the heat, you'll find they've got um, reduced duration of the estrus period, um, less incidence of estrus, and then there's an increase in embryo losses and wastage. So what we're seeing with this heat stress is around estrus, if they're having this heat for the first seven days intimating, you'll find you'll have large quantities of embryo loss um, and wastage of those early sort of fetuses forming. So um, they've said sort of five days before estrus, the heat for a solid five days um, can reduce fertilisation rates by up to 60%. So that's what the trials have sort of shown. Um, and a lot of this testing has been done in sort of heat chambers. So the sheep are kept in house conditions so they can control temperature. So the problem is when they're walking around a paddock, um, you have even larger impacts of heat as far as reduced feed intake within that pregnant ewe. Um, so, you know, in the house conditions, they'll often keep eating, but when they're in a paddock situation, they don't always, um, they'll back off their feed and not eat as much as they normally would. So that's another issue again. So um, it's something to be aware of. There's, I, the end point of this report was that further research is basically required, but, you know, I guess my key practical message for you guys from this is shade. So, you know, if you are joining over summer, looking at, you can't control the weather, like Nathan said, you, you know, you don't have a crystal ball if you're going to have these hot period of two weeks, but having shade in your joining paddocks mean you can have that significant decrease in temperature where the ewes are standing. Um, and I guess the awareness that if your fertilisation rates are back a bit um, or you might end up with ewes join later in their, um, in their joining period just because of that period of heat prior to joining. So we also look at over pregnancy. Um, so they've got um, the effect of cold as well, but today we'll just focus on these heat just because I said in our joining periods in South Australia, those days over 32 degrees I feel are our highest sort of risk. Um, so they've also looked at the effects of heat stress on the actual pregnancy. So as I said, heat stress will reduce the feed intake of a pregnant ewe, but it's also um, reducing placenta and fetal growth outside of the feed intake of the ewe. So it's having a separate effect on that fetus inside as it's forming. So, you know, we've got an extreme here where it's hot the whole pregnancy, but even mid to late gestation, mid gestation or just late gestation, we're seeing this impact of decreased birth weight, decreased survival of a lamb and a decrease in weaning weight, all associated with five days or more of 32 degrees. So the ones they did in, in the housed areas um, have five days of heat over 24 hours, reduced the birth weight of a lamb by 1.76 kilos and over just a 12-hour exposure for each of those five days, reduced it by 0.75 of a kilo. So when you're looking at a five-kilo lamb, it's a significant reduction in lamb birth weight. But yeah, just a bit of a something to think about there, and I'm sure something you'll see a bit more come out of. Um, so I'm going to touch on some ewe mortality, and I'm going to go through some data that's come out um, on ewe mortality. But first I wanted to prompt you guys... Uh, what's normal ewe mortality? Does anyone have a figure they'd call normal? When do you call your local vet? Like, when do you get worried? Is there a line you start to get worried? 10%, 5%, 2%? Where's everyone start to get worried? Yeah, and everyone's got their own level, I guess, on their farm of normal, and it does depend on the age makeup of your flock, um, numbers of multiples, things like that as well. But... Um, I think there's a bit of a gap missing in the industry where we probably don't all know what is normal on our farm. So if you're not recording mortality over lambing, that's probably the first key is just to start recording how many ewes you have lost over that lambing period. Um, so trials that are being conducted in Australia over sort of the last 10 years, we've seen this massive range of between 2 and 11% basically amongst the flocks that have been um, in, in research sort of flocks, um, which a lot of it is done on commercial property. So, you know, in my mind, I probably target with my clients sort of 2% um, and, you know, maybe another percent over the year, just older ewes and misadventure bits and pieces. But, you know, if we get too much more than 2% over that lambing period, we're starting to sort of work out what's going on. But, you know, you guys have to come up with, I guess, where you're sitting and then work out um, whether you're happy with it or whether you need to um, try and improve it. 
But yeah, so I guess a lot of the figures we see are annual figures lost over a year. Um, but for the purpose of this, I like to focus on just what we're losing over lambing. Um, so, you know, there was an MLA report done in 2015 looking at just diseases of priority um, that are affecting sheep production. And the pregnancy ones I was focusing on was dystocia, like those difficult births that can lose, you can lose lambs and ewes, mastitis, pregtox and hypercalcemia. So I'll touch on all of those as we go through. But I guess back to basics, there was a um, really good number of people I could see from my position that have done a lifetime year management course. Um, but, you know, I guess I like to always go back to basics of condition scoring. So, you know, checking the condition your cattle or your um, cows or ewes are in prior to lambing and calving, um, that'll help you predict sort of where your mortality should be. So, obviously, if you're in these under-conditioned stocks, so under two and a half, um, you know, we're looking at up over you know, getting up towards this 5 6% and your multiples are going to have an even higher mortality. So, you know, if your key issue is getting them to lambing in the right condition, that's something you need to focus on first. And as I said, your twin bearing ewes are always at much higher risk of mortality. So, often in a system where we push multiples being conceived, we end up with a higher portion of multiples to singles the ewe mortality across a year will often go up and it's because you're running more higher risk animals. So there's something to keep an eye on, but um, running twins is always going to be harder than running single bearing ewes. So, and I guess, you know, the reason we're so focused on ewe condition score as well is just for this lamb survival. So, you know, as your twin lambs get more, so merinos were aiming for this three and a half condition score at lambing you're more likely to get that four kilo lamb that's got more chance of surviving. Your singles around three kilos will be closer to that optimum um, weight of five kilos. So um, Nathan's already put this up, but basically, you know, in that five kilo range is where we're aiming to try and keep your lambs alive. And it's just because they've got more brown fat, so they've got more of their own fat that lets them stand up, follow their mum, um, and survive before they sort of get their first drink. So you know, your little three kilo lambs don't always have much chance of surviving. So who's um, in the rooms preg scanning? Yep, good to see as well. So um, I've just got some key messages that have come out. So um, Adelaide Uni have also just completed a preg scanning project. So there's a few key messages that are still in draft form. Um, we've sort of got the jump on them, but that'll be coming out of that project shortly. But their data showed only sort of 40% um, of sheep producers in South Australia are preg scanning. Um, and obviously with preg scanning, you can have your wets and dries or your singles and multiples. So with this data I've put up, um, this profitability advantage is if you're scanning for singles and twins. And about half of that is if you're just doing wets and dries. So obviously doing wets and dries, especially if you're in a poor season, means you can get rid of the dry animals, you know, not waste valuable feed on dry animals. But I guess the goal is to have your twins and singles in separate mobs. Um, so when they, the full report goes through different breeding enterprises, different feed situations, different rainfalls, um, and that's the average profitability. But we see a massive increase in profitability for areas with not enough feed, poor years where you're hand feeding, that's where you'll get that real advantage of having your singles and twins separated. And it's because you're basically allocating better paddocks, more sheltered paddocks, more supplementary feed to the animals that need it, and then we'll hopefully reward you with two lambs per most of your ewes. So um, there is that range there. But so $5.75 per ewe scanned over the cost of scanning. Um, so 2,000 new flock, we're looking at an extra profit of $11,500. So significant difference. Um, it has come up in this project versus other data done, and that's just because of the extra price of lambs that you're able to keep alive. So return on investment of 400%. So, you know, hopefully pretty worth spending that money scanning. Within this project, they've also looked at accuracy of scanning. So they've done a lot of double scans seen how many fetuses have been lost. Um, and their key message was basically to prepare ewes properly for scanning. 
So I guess we're seeing some inaccuracy with scanning data, and often it is ewes haven't been off feed for long enough. So you've got to have them off feed and water for your six hours and have them prepped properly to get a good result. And it needs to be 80 to 90 days um, after the rams have gone in with a traditional five-week joining. So I guess there's things as producers you guys can do to get a good result out of your scanning. So I guess the reason we're scanning, um, people that haven't scanned multiples and singles before, I really prompt you to do it to see how many lambs you've lost as well. So if you're running a wet dry mob and you don't know how many twins you've got in there, you don't always know how many fetuses you've actually lost. So what we're looking at is 100 single bearing ewes here. Um, they've got 100 potential fetuses. And so looking at sort of merino industry targets, we're looking at keeping 95% of those alive. Um, so that'll then give you 95 live lambs. Um, your 100 twin bearing ewes, we're looking at 200 potential lambs. Um, and this is where the huge wastage comes in in our industry really is those 60 lost fetuses. So every 100 twin bearing ewes you're putting in a paddock, there's likely to be 60 dead lambs. And that means you're marking 140%, which is merino industry target and fairly acceptable within twin bearing mobs. So, you know, for me, that's where your opportunity is. But also without knowing this data, you can't really calculate what you've lost. So Nathan's um, gone through some of this. Um, so this is the lamb, the golden lamb that Nathan was talking about, but this one actually hasn't survived. So um, same as what Nathan sort of prompted you guys to do, um, I guess it's just taking note of what you're losing and why. So. Um, you know, I've got the same suggestion of weighing your lambs um, because, you know, as a consultant, people will call me and say, we've picked up, you know, there's so many dead lambs in the twin lamb paddock and it's like, what's happened? And without any information, you know, your vet or your consultant can't really work out what's gone wrong there and we can't really fix it for the following year. So, you know, this is that golden lamb that's had a distressed birth, dystocia, probably brain damage. Um, you know, potentially died inside and it's actually not walked or breathed um, or even had a drink. Um, this, these hooves aren't very clear, sorry, but, you know, looking at the dead lambs, that, that lamb's never walked. It's not got dirt on its feet, where this one at the bottom here has walked and has got dirt on its feet. So, you know, if you're finding a heap of these lambs that have never got up, you know you've got a bit of a dystocia, difficult birth, potentially brain damage and they've never even stood up to have a drink, where this animal's potentially had a drink. And, you know, you can go next step, do your own autopsies and check if they've got milk in their stomach and that can answer even more questions again. So, yeah, I feel like talking to farmers over the last sort of year, we probably need a few more lamb autopsy workshops being run um, just so people get a bit comfortable with what they're looking for and it can answer a lot of questions on farm. This here is a brain edema. So um, with dystocia, you know, if you've got large single lambs, um, but it can also be multiples or mispresented lambs, this has basically suffered brain damage as it's been born. So um, by cutting it um, into its brain, you can check if they've got that brain damage. And, you know, that animal's likely not ever drank or walked either because it's had this significant brain damage. So... Um, Basically, this is a trial um, that was done through Massey University, but they actually tracked um, in Australia eight merino and merino cross um, flocks, and they basically just looked at cause of death. So there was 25,789 lambs born across the trial, so significant amounts of data, um, and this is the cause of death they found within the lamb. So I think, you know, it's been reported for years in Australia, dystocia is our biggest risk of losing lambs. Um, so we've got these three types of dystocia. So dystocia A is that brain edema present. So, you know, they've got significant brain damage. They often don't even get up. Um, dystocia B, there's no um, brain, brain damage, but there's central nervous damage still. Um, they're basically stillborn. They won't breathe. Um, and they've never sort of walked or metabolised their own fat for energy. So you know they've basically died during the birthing process or prior. And then dystocia C, 
They've still got central nervous system damage, um, but they've breathed and they've, you can tell inside they've metabolised their own fat. So they've basically all caused lambs not to survive, but different levels of dystocia. But when you add those three together, they're still the most significant cause of loss we saw within these trial animals. Um, starvation, mismothering um, is the next most common. So, you know, there's a lot of data around about mob size. So, you know, lambing small groups of twins together. So, you know, if you imagine if you've got 200 twin bearing ewes in a paddock and they all lamb at their 200%, so you've got 400 potential fetuses. Um, the cause for mismothering is absolutely massive. So, you know, anything you can do practically to reduce this mismothering and the starvation of the lambs that are um, mismothered will have a massive reduction on that. And, you know, there's some things you can't control. You know, predators, you can bait and do what you can, but you can't always reduce these. But, you know, this dystocia, you know, it can be malpresentation, but a lot of it can be nutritional too. So, I think there's things you can look at for these things. Um, exposure we'll touch on shortly. So within this trial, they also looked at sort of chill index. So you know how we said about the birth weight, so you're looking at that optimum survivability of your five kilos. Um, what we find with birth weight is it's basically the ability of that animal to withstand a weather event. So as Nathan said, there's some things you can't plan. You can't plan the weather, but you can plan a sheltered lambing paddock, putting high-risk animals in, and you can plan feeding ewes up to a birth weight that means they're more likely to survive. So we've got here your low birth weight animals. Um, you know, as the chill index gets higher, you've got more rain, more wind, and the temperature goes down. So low birth weight, you know, you're at 1% mortality there. But with a significant weather event, you know, you've gone up to 4%. Medium birth weight, so this was um, 4.6 to 5.6 kilos. And the high birth weight was over 5.6 kilos. So the low one there was under 4 kilos. So that's, you know, a lot of your multiples. So without shelter, they're not going to be able to reduce their chill index with a weather event. But with shelter you can drop the chill index down by at least 100. So that's where you can make a difference to those high-risk animals. So I'm just going to jump back to you mortality. So as we've said, um, this is, I guess, the biggest take-home for me, is what is your ewe mortality and why? Um, and I guess when they're high enough, ewes are worth a lot of money at the moment. At what point do you call your vet and get a disease investigation because you're worried about a number of losses. So, you know, for me, I want to know what's gone wrong and I want to be able to fix it before you land the same thousand ewes down next year. So what we've got, um, so this ewe mortality project was done in 19 and 20 and it was a, a large number of research organisations. So we had Livestock Logic Vet Clinic in Victoria, Pinion Advisory, um, University of Melbourne and also Murdoch University involved. So. It was 51 farms over WA, SA, Victoria. Um, and what they found was a single bearing use um, overall mortality across the two years was 1.4%. Twin bearing use around 2.2%. So just as we said, they're high risk animals. They've got two lambs, they've got to get two out um, and also get through pregnancy developing those two fetuses. Um, the key here, triplet bearing ewes, and we consistently see this um, at 5.1% mortality. Is anyone scanning for triplets? Yep, cool. A few of you? Yeah. So I guess the key is, you know, across merinos especially, we don't get a lot of people scanning for triplets, but, um, you know, all of us have seen um, often your twin bearing mortality will get quite high, especially when you've joined ewes in quite good condition. Um, if you cut the ewes open, you'll often find three lambs. So, you know, with merinos, we often just put them into a multiple mob, um, but be aware that you're potentially conceiving triplets and not managing them as a separate group. Um, so, you know, I think in some ways it can make you feel better about your mortality if you know they were a really high-risk animal. It's just good to know. Um, I'll go through these headings with you. Um, so within this trial... They, basically, the farmers determined cause of death 
And then there was a large number of animals um, that the vets actually did an autopsy on. So this data was across those 51 farms, um, all of the animals that were autopsied. So we've got on this far left side still um, dystocia. So obviously with dystocia in ewe and lamb, you've got the damage happening to the lamb, that means it's not gonna survive. Um, but you've also got those ewes, you've all seen them. They've got stuck lambs, they've maybe got one out, they've gone septic, you know, the ewes died. So, um, you know, that's right up there with the common cause of ewe death across this project. Um, the next two we've got is septicemia and trauma. So septicemia is often damage has happened over that slow birth. Um, they've had lambs stuck inside. Um, so it's often quite associated with dystocia, as also with your trauma sort of to the um, uterus and as they're trying to give birth. So, you know, those three are way up on the largest cause of death. Um, so the next one we've got there, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, is hypocalcemia. Um, so we've got your metabolic issues like hypocalcemia. We've got hypomagnesemia here, which is magnesium deficiency. And we've got um, pregtox in the middle there too. So um, I'll touch on those in a few more slides. But often your hypocalcemia is also associated back with dystocia. So a lot of the animals that died of dystocia also had hypocalcemia. And it's because these minerals are involved in the birthing process. So often if an animal is nutritionally um, not there with minerals or energy, they actually run out of energy to push those lambs out. So, you know, it can end up being that they've stopped giving birth, the lambs are stuck, but sometimes it's a lack of other things that contribute to dystocia. So, um, you know, I guess same as this, the key out of this was we've got a huge issue here, but there's probably more research to be done into where it all sits and with other things. So we've got some other things here like prolapse, um, your mastitis here that often, often happens just after lambing and, you know, some just unknown cause, which you always unfortunately get. So looking at um, the causes of dystocia, so, you know, I think it's, we probably think dystocia is often just large lambs. Um, so often people think they've fed them too much, the lambs are massive. But when you look at this breakdown from this project, um, there was only 15% of the dystocia cases that was actually due to fetal size, so overfed ewes often in the last trimester. Um, so we've got here 58% of animals that were basically malpresented. So, you know, they've come with a leg back um, backwards, so they tried to come out bum first, and the ewe just can't push them out. Um, or often it's twins and they'll both be trying to come out at the same time. So, you know, there are some dystocia, um, you know, that happens that, you know, there's probably not a lot you can do about malpresentation of multiples. But it's the awareness that it could be causing some of your issues. Um, so we've got in here, this is uterine inertia. So that's basically um, contractions have sort of stopped and they've been unable to push out the lamb. So as I said, some of that can be related to nutritional issues that have caused the dystocia as well. And then we've got some issues with just dilation there at 4% and then just significant trauma or unknown sort of dystocia causes. So yeah, just something um, to keep an eye on. And as I said, if your mortality's getting higher, I think that's where you do get a consultant or vet involved. Um, and, you know, with the losses some flocks are seeing, I think it's worth getting to the bottom of what their overall cause was of you and lamb death. So with your metabolic disease, um, a lot of flocks that are grazing in a special cereal zones, you're on these calcium sort of magnesium deficient pastures. Um, and often with your fertiliser history, you're quite, the soils are quite high in potassium and nitrogen. So that'll actually then tie up further absorption of magnesium and cause more of an issue. So, you know, over the last few years, especially when it's been dry and we've been feeding a hell of a lot of grain, I've seen sort of a lot of calcium magnesium deficiencies in use. So um, the interesting part is I guess we know these contribute to you mortality. We supplement and do what we can to balance the rations to prevent it from occurring. Um, 
but this is a recent study that was Charles Sturt University and SARDI, and they actually looked at the, bene the, the flow-on effects, I guess, of subclinical metabolic disease. So, you know, especially in older youths, um, in the study with li that Livestock Logic did, they basically found five-year-old ewes were 2.4 times more likely to die of hypocalcemia than three-year-old ewes, and that's just because of the ongoing drain on their system of um, de depleting calcium year after year, and I've found it significantly worse with grain feeding, as I said, just because there's not enough calcium and too much phosphorus. But what they found in this other study, um, this was done in 2020 as well, um, basically calcium has an effect on your smooth muscle function um, so, and a role in uterine contraction. So if they do have hypocalcemia but survive, they actually have a slower birth process, which means the lambs and ewes are more likely to suffer from dystocia, causing those deaths. So even if you get your ewes through but you're borderline, you're still likely to see a flow-on effect. Um, and the other thing they found was there was an overall effect on lamb survivability. So they had decreased um, colostrum and decreased thermogenesis of the offspring, so that's their ability to stay warm if they were calcium deficiency. And with adequate calcium magnesium, they also found they had improved um, weights at marking. So I guess it's, you know, if you're losing use to these issues, it's worth um, getting on top of so you don't have the flow on effects. So I'll just finish up before I get pulled off stage um, with your, you, another interesting trial just on your ewe lamb mortality versus older ewes. Um, so this was done in New Zealand out of Massey University. Um, they looked at lambing 1,200. Um, they call them ewe hoggets, but we call them ewe lambs when they're joined at sort of six to nine months of age. Um, so basically what they found was, and I guess I'm seeing a lot of people joining ewe lambs, but not always with a good plan of where they need to be and um, the optimum way to join them. So. What they found within this study was as you increase the average daily weight gain from mating through to lambing, there was a much higher risk of lamb mortality. So to me, that's animals that are joined, but you know maybe not quite at target weights, and then they've had to grow quite a bit through pregnancy to hit target weights, um, but they've ended up with much lower levels of lamb survivability. Um, so half of the lamb mortality within the sort of 1,100 ewe lambs that were laying down was due to stillborn um, animals, and that was highly correlated again to that high growth rate through the pregnancy. Um, and the still, stillborn lambs were all just way below optimum birth weights. So it means, you know, to me, we're sort of maybe not targeting the right animals to join. They're a little bit light. Um, and what they found here was some ewe lambs basically petitioned energy to their own growth and not enough into fetal growth. And, you know, across the whole thing, we mark 78% of lambs survive. Um, but I guess the key is all of those lambs we're kind of losing in that system, which, you know, it's an emerging, um, I guess, trend at the moment. You know, I quite like it to boost numbers in en enterprise, but I guess it's just looking at which animals you do join. Um, and then, you know, within the ewe lambs, there is this loss. So we had, you know, the average of 2.5% of ewe mortality, and that actually caused 11% of the lamb death. So, you know, that does have a big impact in older and younger ewes on your overall death rate. Um, and um, basically, there was 1.8% of those that were assisted to lamb. So that's what Nathan said with your fetal size versus your shoulder structure of the animal. So a small... Um, you know, uh, hasn't hit frame size, ewe lamb can't always push out the large lambs. So I'll skip over that one. And, um, yeah, so basically similar take-homes, you know, I guess today is just prompting you guys to plan. And for me, it's just measuring what's causing those, the lamb mortality and what's causing your ewe mortality. Um, you know, call in an expert if you can't work it out just so we can manage the same issue next year. You know, as we said, weighing your lambs, so you work out if you've got undersized lambs or oversized. Um, and, you know, the key, as I said, you'll see this data come out from this preg scanning project, but, you know, we're seeing probably double what's been forecast in the past as far as 
profit increased with preg scanning and, and managing your singles and multiples separately. Um, and also, yeah, so just observing. So I guess you've made your plan, but observe what's happened with those lambs and ewes. And, you know, if something's gone wrong, you know, prior to your lambing again the following year, put in your calendar that you might need some extra supplementation, you might need something balanced, um, you know, you might need to condition score you use to make sure you've got optimum lamb birth weight. So, yeah, plan, observe and then replan. Thank you for that.